Good afternoon and welcome to our City Council informational meeting. Today's date is Tuesday, June 10th, and I'd just like to start out the meeting by wishing my daughter a happy 20th birthday. Um, always a great day when your last teenager is out of the teenager years, yes. Um, welcome to everybody in the Carnegie Chambers, those that might be watching on CityLink or on the internet. We have a rather short agenda today. Um, we will start with City Council open discussion. Um, our councilors are gaining their chairs, so anybody have anything to bring to the open discussion? Councilor Staggers. Well, we'll be talking about this probably next week or so, but I've really gotten a lot of um, people contacting me about the garbage ordinance, proposed one. So I don't know, I, I suppose probably all of you have too. But then I also got something very interesting at my house today. Somebody dropped it by. And I have a list here of City of Sioux Falls dumpsters in violation of screening ordinance. Did you get that too? I got that Dean? one too, yes, oh, sir. Okay. So uh, this is bringing out a lot of interesting issues just besides the regular garbage dumpster. We have plans this night, I think, to, tonight to probably delay the second reading okay. for that for, so we can have more discussion. Thank you, Councilor That sounds Sanders. good. Yes, yes. Other open discussion? <laughs> Councilor Jameson. Uh, thank you. Last week we had our uh, final transit task force meeting and uh, last Wednesday. And... Uh, There'll be a formal presentation given to the full council on all the details, but we've really, uh, I think, come up with a strategy for the future of transit in our city, and it's going to require the council uh, doing a few things that may be a little painful, but I think that's all in good effort to create a healthy system for the city. Uh, look for that final presentation to come to the full council and a f more formal presentation. So... That's coming. And as well, uh, last week during the uh, big uh, hailstorm, I was in Wagner, South Dakota for the South Dakota Municipal League. And uh, nothing really new there to report, but uh, we're making uh, headway uh, to be better organized across the state to uh, bring better issues, issues that we can have former, maybe former legislators uh, address uh, in the session, so maybe we can get some insight from Christine Erickson someday, but um, anyway, that happened last week. If any, any questions about either of those two meetings, uh, let me know. I, I have a question for you, Councilman Jamison. Uh, in your discussions and in those meetings, was there anything that came up that, uh, you know, might affect our legislative priorities that we're looking at setting this year? Uh, nothing that uh, I would say or uh, that I could come up with. Uh, we had a board meeting. It was really internal. A lot of things that we're uh, dealing with as a board, as an organization. So uh, nothing to do with those legislative priorities just yet. Okay. Thank you. And thank, uh, thank you for your work, too, on that transit task force. I know there's been a lot of heavy lifting, I guess, to phrase uh, maybe overused term, but thank you for that work. Councilor Erpenbach. I just was going to respond to Councilor Anderson. We have an email either yesterday or today with our assignments for the policy committees for municipal leagues. So that's really when that heavy lifting happens with legislative things. So that's in August. But we need to kind of have those conversations ahead of that time. Councilor Erickson. Uh, one of the things that um, I talked to a, a couple people about in regards to our legislative priorities is we have um, a handful of fantastic legislators that serve our community and serve our city as well as the surrounding communities and we all have the same goal of making um, Sioux Falls in South Dakota a desirable place to raise family, conduct business, the list goes on. Um, and so for me what um, I saw as a legislator in the past is I would really encourage us as a group um, to somehow come together, invite the legislators, um, get their ideas of what they want to work on and how we can better Sioux Falls as a whole. Because we're working alongside each other, I think you'll be amazed at what will be accomplished at the end of the day. Um, and 
you know, truly we all have the same goal, and if we can work alongside each other, we may have a few other priorities that maybe a legislator doesn't want to carry or doesn't want to do, but if we can just have maybe a brainstorming session um, before we really just say, here's our legislative priorities, run with it. Instead of just handing off our sheet and saying, this is what's important to us as a council, meeting together and talking about what is important for us as a community, as a council, as legislators, as um, city officials, um, the counties, um, and, and doing it together alongside each other. At the end of the day, you know, Sioux Falls City Council will come up with their legislative priorities, but I just feel it's so important if we could really just work alongside. That's just my two cents. No, and it's appreciated, and I know um, the intent in the month of July, I believe, we were planning on having at one of our working sessions a discussion on our legislative priorities. And I don't know if there'd be a time if we could invite some of the le local legislators, but it's, a, it's an idea maybe to mull over before that meeting and, and to consider that. Councillor Erpenbach? Well, and, and Councillor Erickson and I talked about this last week, and I think it's a great idea to really start at the... The only thing is that this is a, an election year for the legislature, and so we talked about that idea of maybe we have kind of a skeleton outline of what we want to do, but then as soon as we know who won in November, maybe then we have that sort of brainstorming session with them so that we can come together on some great ideas, because we want to know what directors, you know, what what things need to happen for the city of Sioux Falls, but you know that, that maybe we can kind of pre-plan this brainstorming session, but I just think it's a great idea to work in concert with those folks. Okay. Okay. Councillor Kiley. I, th I think in addition to what uh, Councillor Erickson mentioned, uh, it's, a, it's a great idea for this council to get together with our local legislators, and we may be able to go even beyond that too. With the, because they often have the legislative coffees, and I've already had a few contact me and asked me if I would like to participate with them with their, with their coffees, and I think that would allow us and the citizens of Sioux Falls also to have their input at the same time, too, and have contact with both city council and local legislators. So I would encourage us all to do, to do just that. If we're asked, okay. And I would also, I mean, we, Jim David is our legislative and operations manager, and I mean, this, this is in his wheelhouse, and this is what we really need to coordinate our efforts in this type of idea and planning through him to make these things come together. So all good ideas. Any other input? Thank you, counselors. Uh, today we're going to have, after the, right after the informational meeting, we will have our Public Services Committee meeting. So immediately following this, about 10 minutes after adjournment, we'll start our Public Services Committee meeting. Today we have uh, one report. It's the annual report from the Washington Pavilion, and we have Mr. Larry Tall and Scott Peterson, co-presidents of the Washington Pavilion of Arts and Sciences here today. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the City Council. I'm Larry Toll, one of the co-presidents. Uh, and as you were just talking about the legislative issues and waiting to see who's elected, uh, we're a little later this year because we are, uh, we're waiting knowing that there were going to be at least two new city councilors. So uh, our report comes to you a little later than normal. Uh, but uh, it's almost a year ago that we made the Board of Trustees of the Pavilion announce that uh, we were going to go to a co-presidency at the pavilion with uh, Scott Peterson and I in the, the lead of that. And uh, some of you have said my routine has gotten a little boring over the last year, so they, you, you asked for a little different program. So uh, let me introduce my co-president, Scott Peterson. <laughs> Good afternoon. This is our first tag team public uh, presentation, so please bear with us. Uh, a little background. So. Um, I was uh, 25 years in, in public business with, at Logitech Interactive. I was part of the startup team, and uh, we grew our business. And after 25 years, and I was chairman and CEO for 13 of the years, I figured it was time to step back and do something else in life. And took a personal sabbatical, and after about, uh, about a year, in fact, it was about a year ago right now, Larry approached me and said, you know, I'm having a lot of fun, but I'd love to slow down a little bit uh, in my life and, and thought maybe um, uh, I could join him in that uh, in that effort, and uh, so right now it's taking two two guys with gray hair to do one person's job, and, but we're, we're having a great time, and, and there's a lot of things going on. So what I'd like to do is just give you a perspective. It's kind of like what I did at summer camp or what I learned at summer camp. I've been at the pavilion now for nine months, 
I thought I'd just give you a couple observations because I think that it's uh, basically an outsider coming in and, and seeing what a, a basically a wonderful facility, a wonderful organization providing a great amount of value. Uh, first of all, I think the, the pavilion is, I think, uh, the epitome of a successful public-private partnership um, where the city owns the building. And, and what I've also found is a lot of the public doesn't really understand the relationship between the city and the Washington Pavilion Management uh, uh, Incorporated. Um, you know, it's more like everybody thinks it's kind of the city's operation. Well, I think you got put together very smartly where the city owns the building, you're providing us funds basically to, to take care of the facility, the, the capital improvements required, uh, and that city funding is coming out of the entertainment tax, and the city funding is about 20% of our top line revenue. So it's a, it's a significant portion, but it doesn't represent, you know, a, a, an overly large percentage either uh, from that percentage, uh, from that perspective. And then our private non-public takes all the responsibility and risk of programming the activities of the building, uh, selecting Broadway shows, concerts, running education programs, uh, science exhibits, et cetera. And in my perspective, after nine months uh, there, uh, is that uh, it's one tough business to make, a, you know, make the, uh, the books balance on uh, in arts and entertainment uh, in any community. And uh, but we've got a wonderful staff that does that. And I think the other important thing a lot of people don't understand is the city does not have any financial obligation for our deficits. So if we bomb on a show, that's not your problem, that's our problem. And you know, we're, we're there to, 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 to hopefully always provide a little bit of black on that, on that uh, financial page. And also I tell you, I'm very impressed with the interactions uh, between the pavilion uh, organization and, and the city. Uh, we have three um, uh, appointees on our board of trustees, which provide great value. Uh, currently Brad Hegel, Susan Hassler, and Emily Paulson are just coming on board. And then Tracy Turback and, and his staff and, and uh, Darren Smith and his team provide a great amount of support uh, in uh, working together on making sure the building is sound. Uh, Tracy is also on our executive finance committee, so he's actively involved in understanding where we are from a financial standpoint. Uh, the pavilion staff, I tell you, it's a very uh, talented group, highly committed uh, to delivering on the mission of the pavilion. And the mission of the pavilion is to educate, entertain, inspire, and enrich our community by making arts and sciences part of our lives. And you probably have, our, our tagline is, uh, is yours, mine, and ours. And I think that really encapsulates, you know, the spirit that we, that we do bring to the community. A uh, group of, a uh, wonderful group, a troop of people. We have 50 full-time staff, a lot of uh, longevity uh, within that, uh, with that group. Part-time, uh, up to 200, anywhere from uh, stagehands to teachers, after preschool teachers, camp, uh, instructors, and then we have dedicated volunteers, and many of these actually go back to the first day the pavilion opened up, and many were actually educators in the Washington uh, um, High School when it was still, you know, operating there in that location. Over 16,000 hours per year are uh, contributed by our volunteers, so that's, it's actually could be well over $200,000 of economic value uh, from our volunteer community. And then also from a planning standpoint, uh, forward-looking, we're right now going through a, a five-year review of a strategic plan. The you know, whole idea is to keep it fresh, uh, keep the programs uh, uh, moving forward, uh, responding to what the community is looking for, making sure it's meaningful uh, to the Sioux Falls community. And then clearly the, I believe the pavilion is delivering on a, a wide variety of programming, which I got to tell you I was surprised when you see all the different shows and, and really think about it, to a very diverse group of audiences. Uh, every time we put on a reception or performance, uh, it is a different group of local citizens, of regional uh, uh, audiences that, that come. My experience uh, started with War Horse, which was phenomenal. Uh, it was a great experience for Sioux Falls. We just ended with a great uh, run at Jersey Boys, uh, which set all ki kinds of records as far as attendance. I'll let Larry talk about that. In 2013, which is the financial year we're talking about, we sold almost 90,000 tickets, uh, and 69% of the ticket buyers came from Sioux Falls. So a lot of participation within the community. 2014 will, uh, have, will be higher than that. Uh, Jersey Boys by itself, uh, we sold nearly 12,000 tickets. So that's a very, you know, that'll probably set the high water mark, at least in this era. Uh, and an amazing diversity of audiences. I mean, I've witnessed Beauty and the Beast where all uh, little uh, girls with their uh, yellow dresses are coming with their moms and dads and grandparents, to Blues Brothers, to uh, Dancing with the Stars, uh, which was uh, you know, TV personalities here in Sioux Falls. 
And then uh, I got to tell you, I saw Spank, and that was also a very diverse audience and a, you know, an, an interesting uh, presentation here in the community. Our uh, science center, uh, huge draw for kids. Uh, it, you know when the science center is happening because the, the sound of kids are echoing through the building. I think it's fantastic. Uh, last year, T. Rex named Sue was was uh, resident on her fourth floor. Brought in lots of uh, lots of people. We just opened with Hands on Harley. That's running now uh, through the end of September or close to the end of September. Ninety thousand people through the art center last year. Fifty percent from Sioux Falls. Fifty percent drawn from our communities. Uh, both here in the state and in, in around, and Larry will, will give you more information on that. And we're also working with our OSEP budget to refresh the science exhibits. Uh, most have not been significantly handled since 1999, early days of the internet, 1999. So a lot of things have changed. It's time to kind of focus on some updates. But core technology, core sciences don't change. Technology, of course, keeps moving right along. Visual Arts Center, you know, as you think about it, we just finished toulouse lautrec which ends on Saturday. Uh, it's really a metropolitan experience inside Sioux Quartzsite. So it's a, it's a wonderful, uh, I think, uh, opportunity for Sioux Falls to see major events, and but also local, local artists. We focus on local artists, giving them a chance to display their art. We have 301, uh, Studio 301 in the fall and Arts Night in the spring. Uh, the events that, that handled there, that's the other thing that kind of really so caught me by surprise, how many things Something is always happening, drawing all types of audiences. Weddings, we do 35 to 45 weddings per year. There's award ceremonies from MB to Avera Foundations to on and on, even funerals. So it's a very diverse type of activities that happen there. And then education, that's our fourth pillar, uh, which was our greatest, my greatest, most uh, probably impressive surprise. Uh, excuse me. That's my, that's my, uh, who knows what that is? Um, we, uh, you know, given the size of the facility and the, the classroom space is not significant, so we really focused on outreach. Um, 30,000 students last year were addressed through our programs. 20,000 of those students were addressed outside of our walls. Uh, preschool, uh, kindergarten classes, summer camps and classes are going on right now. Uh, DAPA play for living in schools. 70 performances by our uh, student uh, actors. Uh, uh, addressed over 7,000 students in the audience about things that happen in their daily lives. And then action arts and science program, 500 at-risk students are, are um, touched each week uh, for educating on science for one semester and arts on the other semester in 17 schools with 20 different programs. And one of the key factors the staff does think about, and I just want you to know, is diversity and accessibility when it comes to programming. A lot of times everybody thinks about that you have to have its own Broadway shows and big ticket prices. Uh, we have first free first Fridays. Science Center and the Visual Arts Center are open every, the first Friday of every month. Uh, 8,800 parents and their kids came to first Friday last year. So it's, it's about um, 800 uh, per, uh, and e evenly balanced. Uh, usually one, one parent and, and uh, one uh, child or two and two. So I'm very impressed by that. Student scholarships for those who can't afford. Uh, last year, we uh, gave out $11,100 of scholarship monies so to be able to pay for any classes that, were, um, that had charges that the uh, student couldn't afford on their own. Last weekend, Wells Fargo was a corporate sponsor for D-Day, the uh, documentary um, narrated by Tom Brokaw. Uh, it was, because of that, it was free to all vets and military. I uh, had a very nice turnout for that. We're going to do that again on the 4th of July weekend and once again on Labor Day. And the list just goes on and on and on. You could, I could spend hours doing this. Uh, but overall, I would tell you, personally, I'm very proud to be associated with the pavilion. It's a wonderful facility providing great mission to our community. I think the entire city ought to uh, be very proud of it. We saved the building on one hand, uh, and I think our mission, our partnership together is, is delivering on that promise. And with that, I'm going to hand this back over to either my co-president, sometimes referred as my co-bro, but he's clearly the better half. So, Larry, it's all yours. Thank you, Scott. Um, it's great to have, and if you ever come to visit us, you'll find we're both in the same office. The whole theory of this was that we would both work about half time. Uh, that part hasn't worked out really well. Uh, both of us are working about three quarters time, but uh, it's a labor of love, and, and uh, we enjoy that. I get to do the boring stuff. Uh, you've seen this before. This is the typical 
annual report we give you uh, that shows the revenues and the expenses for the pavilion. The, there is a, I provided a copy of our audit which was completed by Ide Bailey, uh, the city clerk has that. It has a lot more detail in it and we file that obviously every year as we have an audit every year. But I think the upshot is your city funding is, as Scott said, a significant portion of what we get and we appreciate that. We try to use that very wisely, obviously. One of the things we do, if you cut right to the bottom line and you see the board designated fund transfer, since this was uh, one of the best years we've had, we just, the board decided rather than rely on having a line of credit only to fall back on, let's start putting in, like the city does, your 25% reserve. Try to get to that point where we have a 25% reserve because I recall 2008 and 2009 very clearly that one of the f when, when you hit a recessionary time, one of the first things that happens is that people cut back on their entertainment dollars. So we're trying to create, be fiscally responsible, create our own funds so that we have something to fall back on when those times do get hard. Um, other thing that I would tell you that is fascinating this year is we measure each of our organizations as to how they have done financially and all three pillars of the pavilion, the, the performing arts, the visual arts, and the science center were net revenue contributors this year uh, for the Science Center. That is the first year ever. Uh, and while it's not a huge amount, it is in the black, and that's definitely good. Um, we do contribute. Uh, our education wing, as you might guess, uh, experienced a $113,000 loss, but that's part of the mission-related thing that we don't <coughs> always and in, don't intend to make money at it just uh, because of what we do. It's the part of the outreach, part of the mission. Um, <coughs> and the, the whole reason I think Science Center went positive was uh, because of the fact that we brought in the T-Rex named Sue and that was of course along with your support for funding for that traveling show plus we've got a, uh, a grant from a local 501c3 that helped us, but what happened there was we ended up with about a 40% increase in attendance in the last quarter of the year when Sue, Sue was there, and that is what pushed us over the edge for that. So it was a great, great uh, opportunity. Um, taxes and, and uh, that we collected and remitted last year with a little over 350000 uh, 121,000 of that goes to the 2% city sales tax and the 1% uh, entertainment tax. Um, and just as an aside, I, I looked at Jersey Boys today, and Jersey Boys alone contributed $74,000 worth of taxes. So uh, a portion of that obviously will come back to the city as well. Economic impact, I, I've been here and I've talked to you about that in the past, um, how we believe we're about a $20 million economic impact on the community. We feel like uh, the unmeasurable piece of that is what, how we help the community look as Avera and Sanford and a variety of other people that are bringing in people from out of the community trying to hire them make this look like a bigger community and, and really more attractive community and goes along with all the other things we have with city parks and the like. But I thought I'd give you a little more insight this year into some specifics of that economic impact. Scott mentioned the Kirby Science Discovery Center. We had 91,000 people go through the, the Science Center uh, last year. 53% of those came from Sioux Falls, but 25% came from 223 other different South Dakota communities, and the remaining 21 percent hailed from 48 states and Canada. So getting a lot of great outside input. He mentioned the fact that while 70 percent of the people that come to the shows in the Mary W. Somerville Hall uh, come from Sioux Falls, we also had 44 states and 235 South Dakota communities represented in that crowd. But I looked last, uh, last day I looked at Jersey Boys because it really was, as Scott said, quite, quite the event. 46% uh, of that audience came from outside of Sioux Falls. We had 182 different South Dakota communities representing 34% of the audience, 
and we had another 12% of the attendees came from 32 other states. Of the 12,000 tickets roughly that were sold, over 4,000 of them were people that had never been to the pavilion before and 69% of those came from out of Sioux Falls. Uh, Downtown Holiday Inn was booked almost every night that Jersey Boys was here. Um, if you didn't have a reservation at Minerva's, Grill 26, Crawford's, uh, or any of the other downtown restaurants, uh, you were not going to get in. Uh, they, uh, it was crazy all over town, and uh, it was a great, great opportunity for us to showcase a great show in Sioux Falls. And uh, in addition, we had a lot of employment. We had 75 stagehands that were there to unload the, seven, uh, the nine semis that the show came in with, and then, of course, they were there again Sunday afternoon to try to reload those shows uh, to be able to get them back on the road on the way to El Paso, Texas. So uh, with that, I won't bore you anymore, but we have huge economic impact in, at the pavilion. Um, coming up, we've got some other things I think that you'd be interested in. We are uh, inviting the Prairie Preve Prevention Center to come to uh, the pavilion in August, if you are familiar with them, they do the underwear and sock giveaway. We're, we're going to make the Science Center and the Art Center available to that group. We're anticipating a thousand kids and their parents, and these are children that probably typically don't get to the pavilion, so it's an opportunity to open up the pavilion to them. Uh, in the fall, in October or September, Scott can correct me. September, uh, the Festival of Books will be here in Sioux Falls, and there will be a new element this year. It will be uh, a children's festival along with the regular one. The city, the uh, all the third graders in Sioux Falls has, have been provided a book by Kate DiCamillo called uh, The Miraculous Journey of Edward Tulane. We, uh, Kate will be here, and we will be bringing in 1,800 fourth graders that have hopefully read their book uh, sometime between when they were given it this last school year and when she shows up. But we'll have about eight other authors that will be there as well and a variety of things for, for children in the book festival. So we're really looking forward to doing that. Other things we did this year, uh, we added, uh, along working with Sertoma, we added a looping system. And a looping system is for hearing impaired people. And we've, we've spent 32000 to loop the orchestra level of the Mary W. Somerville Hall. And what the looping system does is it provides a way for people with hearing aids to switch from uh, to a T-coil setting on their hearing aid to be able to pick it up off this loop that we run through the hall. And I've gotten a lot of good feedback from people, uh, and it's been a, a, an advantage to us because now we can market to more of the hearing impaired people. If you have hearing problems but don't wear a hearing aid, we also have sets available at the box office for you to use. Um, if you recall, the IRS a couple, a year and a half, almost two years ago, seized a collection that we were housing for, uh, it was called the Northern Plains Tribal Art Collection. It was 16 pieces of art and uh, the IRS seized that. We were successful in bidding and getting that collection back, buying it, but then we took, we also took what was known as the Egger Library, which is uh, on the third floor in the northwest corner of the building, uh, and opened, there was an opening yet between the Everest Gallery and that room, and we opened that up and we've converted that now to the Egger Gallery and invested uh, Twenty some thousand dollars in improving that room so that we we hang our native art in there uh, continually. Uh, lastly, uh, we op last year we opened the South Dakota African American History Museum. Uh, it's amazing as every time I walk down that hallway, and, and we've got somewhere around 1,200 campers and class kids coming in through the summer. There are people at that window, and they have been very good about. Uh, coming in and changing the exhibit, and but they still have a lot more material, and we would like to look to the other side of the hall, and there's an area that we could open up that would be about two feet deep, and we could give them about another 40 feet to display their materials and as well give them some kind of a uh, 
access to storage there so that they would be able to, to come and change that out. And we think we can do that for twenty to $25,000. It's not in the CIP, but if uh, hopefully the economy will be such that this, there might be surpluses, and I would encourage you to think about that because it's, it's a great addition to our facility. And with that, I would, Scott and I would be more than willing to open for questions. Councilor Erpenbach. Thank you. Thanks for the report, both of you. What do you call yourselves, Cobro? Cobros, yes. It's a technical term. Yes. We have another one that's called the POW, President of the Week. <laughs> <laughs> Good. It's exciting to see you guys job sharing and doing all these interesting things. A couple of things I need for clarification. One, Larry, you talked about the sales tax and entertainment tax that you collected that would then have gone to the state and parts of it come back to the city. How much went to our entertainment tax? I have 120, maybe, maybe I've got this wrong. 121,000 yes. was 2% sales tax. And yeah. then what was the entertainment uh, no, tax? The, oh. uh, that's the combination of the two. Oh, okay. City sales tax was 88,000 and the tourism or the entertainment tax was 33,000. 33,000 for the entertainment tax. Okay. And then my other question is about that, um, the African American Heritage Museum that um, so amazingly fills up that space. Talk, uh, can you talk about who, who's in charge of that and how do we, I mean, are we staffing that then? How does that work for us? Uh, the South Dakota African American History Museum board, it comes in and they change it out. So they will bring in uh, pieces out of their collection. They'll bring it in. They've. Uh, if you've noticed that the glass is uh, kind of open and air gets in there, so they've gone in, they've had to clean it a couple times, but they come in, they rearrange it, and they, they bring all the materials. The content isn't totally theirs. And if I might, one more, where do they store that material when it's not, what the parts that are not on display? Uh, at, used typically at a board member's home someplace. Okay. So they have no place today. Okay, great, thank you. Other questions, Councilor Staggers? <clears throat> Uh, Larry, you said that uh, uh, you're going to start trying to develop a reserve. Do you have any uh, idea of how much money you want to try to have in reserve? Well, if, we, if we were to look at a $7 million budget uh, and 25% of that's going to be about $1.7 million, uh, it's a dream. Oh. Um, I think the economy will have to stay good and we'll have to be incredibly successful to get there. That's a nice dream to have. That's, yeah. that's good. But also at the same time, are you thinking about maybe trying to reduce the subsidy that the city gives you? It, there are certain parts of what we do that will never make money. I, I, it's just, when, when I say that the Visual Arts Center and the Science Center were net positive, that's literally total revenues against expenses. It, it has nothing for shared costs like utilities, and, and a lot of that obviously is covered with the, the city's support. Mm -hmm. But it's, those, all those shared costs are, are above and beyond. So for each organization at, that goes net positive, their contribution is towards offsetting that. Um, I would have said it'd be a, a you know, it'd, be, it'd have to snow on the 4th of July before we do it. But after this winter, that might happen. You never know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Any other questions? Gentlemen, thank you for what you do. It is a beautiful facility in a um, great city. I, I just have one question. Maybe you could um, tell me a little bit about it. The first Friday events, talk about not making money, but I know it's a great service to our community. Have you had any reaction or what feedback from the community? Um, great. I, we, we have three sponsors that, are, that make a contribution towards it, but if you take the uh, roughly 9,000 people went through, and if the, the average cost, if it, they were to buy a ticket, would be somewhere in the $9 range. So you're looking at somewhere around uh, 9 times 9,000, $81,000. Um, the, the sponsors obviously don't cover that amount. But what we found is we've got these great partners. If you had been over there uh, last Friday, Eros came in, and they set up a variety of booths to teach earth science. And so each of the kids that came uh, got a passport and they went to each of the stations where they'd get a stamp and after they uh, got their, all of their areas stamped, they'd go over and they got a junior scientist pin, which was specifically made for Free First Friday. 
Um, I got one, but I, I, they said I actually was a senior scientist <laughs> with junior <laughs> skills. <laughs> but uh, those are the things, I mean, it just expands beyond that uh, to, because people take an interest because this is the outreach we do of uh, providing access to people that wouldn't otherwise have it. And it brings a lot of people downtown. It it so um, it is for three hours from five to eight and 900 people on average in those three hours. So it fills up. It's young families. Uh, and as I said, it's usually the adult and the, and the kid ratio is pretty close to one to one. So that means it's, it's parents, the families coming uh, to, to experience the science. And we're trying to also bring them into the art center too. It's not as exciting over there, but try to also provide some you know, exposure to, to that side of the, the building. So I, it's really a, it's quite an event every month. Great, great. Anything else, Council? Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Thanks. That concludes today's presentations. I will adjourn our meeting. The Public Service Committee will meet at 446. Meeting adjourned. <laughs>